Assalamu alaikum ji. With your permission, let's start this session. We are running slightly late. Um, some of our guests have to travel. Some have been waiting, uh, but these things happen. So I hope uh, we make it worth your while. Let me very warmly welcome my three uh, guests here today. Justice Atar Manila sahab, who especially uh, has come for this. He's traveled from another city, and uh, he is uh, quite well known to all of you. He has been uh, the Chief Justice of the Islamabad High Court for four years and recently elevated to the Supreme Court of Pakistan. We have Madam Rabia Javeri, who's uh, participating from uh, Karachi. She couldn't be here in person, was kind enough to take out the time. She has served in various senior uh, government positions, including as the Secretary of the Ministry of Human Rights, and she's currently the Chair of the National Commission of Human Rights, which is our apex rights protection, autonomous apex rights protection body. Sayyid Ali Murtaza, who's a very old time friend, colleague, and counterpart in law reform work. He's uh, worked in an independent capacity on the justice sector, but also served in various key positions, including uh, Secretary Law, Secretary Home, on a couple of occasions, uh, the additional Chief Secretary, also Secretary Prosecution. So he's had a fair level of um, interface. Um, let me very quickly uh, perhaps clarify uh, what we don't intend to speak about, although I shudder to say that because in the presence of a Supreme Court judge, you can always be questioned and told to uh, change your mind. But uh, the idea here was that there is a lot of conversation in Pakistan about constitutional politics. There's a lot of const uh, you know, conversation around key cases and areas which overlap between the law and politics, which is perfectly legitimate and incredibly important. What we perhaps don't talk about as much is the systemic performance of the justice sector. And by that I really mean how the justice sector serves the citizens in terms of the services it provides. And it's a very complex sector, unlike education or health, which are complex. Justice is very, very complicated because there's no single notion of justice and there can be shades of meaning uh, involved. When I speak of the justice sector, I mean the entire spectrum of the justice sector, from the courts to the police to the prosecution, um, to forensics, to probation, parole, um, police, uh, also arbitration. Anything which has to do with civil and criminal uh, justice delivery is part of this spectrum. Now, and, and, and we also have to envision the justice sector not only in its entirety, but also as something which is deeply integrated because if you think about any particular legal case, it actually interfaces with multiple institutions. It's not a single institution. Um, the other thing which is important to uh, remember here is that the fact that we are not going to directly talk about how people fare under the justice system is not because that is being neglected. That's a given. The reason that we are here is because there is a challenge. There is discontent, whether it is locally, whether it's in terms of international indicators, like the World Justice Project Rule of Law Index, which is oft cited, but we must remember that is something which looks at multiple factors and multiple institutions and not just one. So I think it's a given, as far as this uh, particular audience is concerned, that there are huge challenges, challenges of citizen access, speed, cost, quality, complexity, intelligibility, coordination, you name it. The reason why we want to talk about institutions is because we are moving from that premise and trying to look at what has happened to law reforms, the phenomenon of reforms. And the final thing I'd like to say is that if you look at reforms themselves, you can cut them, you can periodize them in various ways. And this is not self-promotion, just an indication. I made an attempt some years ago, and this is a 2013 book, book which I published, which, amongst other things, actually tries to periodize and critically analyze Pakistan's justice sector reform experience since 1947. My own sense is that you can very broadly divide it. There are multiple approaches. I came up with seven. My idea is that you can broadly categorize the law reform experience as the pre-2000-2003 reform experience, where you had incremental attempts at reforms. You know, reform this law, tweak this procedure, then you had this massive international donor-funded reform phenomenon starting in the early 2000s, which has continued over the last decade and a half to two decades, although it's tapered off somewhat, and there are some more organic attempts as well. So that's the background, uh, the context. My very first question, um, I'd like to start with you, uh, Justice Malilla, if I may, and then go to Madam Rabia Javeri. I hope we have connection with her. I, uh, do we have 
Can she hear us? Can she? S do we know? Can you yes, hear? I us? can hear you. Very okay, well. fantastic. Thank I can you. hear you. Thank so you. I am going to just start with Justice Manila and then come directly to you. And my question is this, and I also shared this in advance. Before you prescribe any reform, you have to diagnose the nature of the problem. Diagnostics are very important. And you can have multiple views on what has been diagnosed. I'm not at all saying that there's a homogenous view. But in terms of the adequacy of diagnostics, do you think we are still at that stage after all these years that we're still trying to exactly pinpoint and diagnose the problems because of which justice sector reforms have not taken place? I, if I may start with that submission, and, and seek your reaction to that. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Sama. It's a pleasure and an honor to be here. I think I must share with all of you the experience we have had at the Islamabad High Court for four years. We as judges, we know the problems. The problem, biggest problem is a huge backlog we realize questions are raised about the integrity of the judicial system as well. At times, people also uh, do criticize that some of the judgments they want in reasoning. But despite all this, there have been efforts of reforms. But in my view, the reforms were based on individuals. Mm -hmm. An individual who comes as a chief justice, I mean, he would start a reform. In all these years, there hasn't been an attempt to institutionalize the process of reform. Diagnostic, yes. Uh, there's a, a popular sentiment that judiciary must do better. Uh, better. And we also know that it has to do better. We are also aware as judges that people do not have that confidence which a judicial system uh, actually has to ensure that the people that it serves, they have confidence in it. For four years, when I was elevated as the Chief Justice, I was fortunate that we had an exceptionally brilliant team of judges. We were all passionate about the reform process. Initially, we were doing it on our own, but, I mean, looking at other examples, other high courts would approach, I mean, we realized that we were not experts in reforms. We were not experts in re-engineering the processes. Even when you talk about diagnostic, yes, we knew broadly what was wrong with the system, but we wanted to start with a new slate. And initially it was frustrating, but we found the answer in the Constitution. And the Constitution, the principle of policy, you see, I think that's the most important chapter in the Constitution, and that is part two of the Constitution, which has two chapters, one on fundamental rights and the other on principles of policy. The most important principle of policy is Clause D of Article 37 of the Constitution, which says that the state has to ensure that there is inexpensive and expeditious justice. So that was, in fact, the basis of our vision in the Islamabad High Court. But then we had to look at an answer, solution that who would ensure that? What is a state? Are we, as a judicial institution, a state? And the answer, again, was in the Constitution because Article 7 identified what the, 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 those players of the state, and they surprisingly did not include the judiciary. It included the executive, both the provincial and the federal governments, the majlis e shura and any entity or organization 
empowered to impose a tax or cess. And it was the responsibility of the state. So the diagnosis, diagnosis also ought to have come from the state to ensure that it fulfills its constitutional obligation. Again, a very important, uh, which probably very few people might have noticed, is Article 29 of the Constitution. Sub-Article 3 makes it a constitutional obligation of the President in matters relating to the affairs of the Federation to lay before the Majlis Ashura each year a report on the implementation status of the principal, principles of policy, which included the state's responsibility to ensure expeditious and inexpensive justice. So from there, we felt, and as far as the provinces are concerned, it's the obligation of the governors. But it didn't end there. The same article of the Constitution has made it an obligation of the legislatures, whether the federal legislature or the provincial legislatures, to debate and to consider such reports. So that, for us, was an accountability of the reform process as well. And looking at these constitutional provisions, we put together a blueprint that we will start with the diagnostic, but we wanted to ensure that there is continuity of the reform process and also to bring on board all the stakeholders identified in the Constitution. Before going for the diagnostic, because we wanted a third party independent entity to come and diagnose our problems and tell us so that from there we take a start. Because as I mentioned, we wanted to start from a clean slate. And we set up a forum which has a permanent basis, a permanently established forum, and we gave the ownership to the federal government. We engaged with them. We are part of that forum, the Chief Justice and the judges. But at the same time, the fo forum also includes the federal government. And I'm very glad to say this, that we engaged with LAMS as well and other institutions. And they all were excited about it. So, I mean, we have put that in place, and the focal authority for that is, again, the executive. And that is the uh, public and private partnership authority uh, controlled by the federal government. That's our focal person. Now, we started with finding a solution and the diagnostic, because that was the most important document. I know, I mean, in every high court, a lot of work has been done. Dr. Osama himself has done a lot of work. But we wanted to utilize all this good work done in other high courts as well. As well. But we wanted a forum that has, has permanence and that would ensure the continuity and with that, you see, we have started with the diagnostic as well. No, thank you so much for your response. I think your point is very well taken, both about reform continuity and also having a, a wider multifarious forum which takes this forward. And what you're talking about obviously is unfolding and very exciting to see what happens through this initiative. Uh, that point is very well taken. I do have several points um, to further problematize this, you know, to deepen the conversation. Um, and I'll probably try and get that. There has been a national judicial policy for many years. So ostensibly the courts, for instance, were taking ownership and they did invite to these annual uh, conferences other stakeholders. As you mentioned, there has been work done before. So four years ago, and Ali sitting here was also involved along uh, across the table, myself, various people worked. 
And we had an extensive uh, diagnosis of why cases get delayed and a case flow management system. And yet, unfortunately, four years down the road, and for the first time, you know, the Civil and Criminal Procedure Code were amended maybe 150 years, we still haven't seen an impact. So my fear as a citizen or as a person working on this is that whether any future endeavor will also get constrained and kneecapped by factors which have kneecapped it in the past. You've pointed out some. No institutional ownership, no across the institutional ownership. We'll come back to that because I do want to understand that what is it that because a lot of the diagnostics have been done and any new, but you know, we keep reinventing the wheel in certain ways. So that can be uh, uh, an issue, but we'll come back to that. Uh, Madam Rabia, on the same point, you have seen the Ministry of Human Rights function. We've had a chance to uh, work together. Now you're running the National Commission. I know there are specific challenges and issues uh, as to human rights protection and these two institutions. But in a more macro sense, because you've looked at things for a considerable period of time across institutions, do you feel that our problem still is that we haven't completely and accurately diagnosed why the legal process doesn't work, why it gets abused, or is it something else? Uh, are we still at the diagnostic stage, 50, 75 years down the road? This will I'm wondering, thank you, Sama. Um, thank you very much for the privilege of being here. Um, I am going to pin your question into um, real time and re a human story because I think it's very important when we talk about all systemic changes to actually look at the human perspective. Mm. The Commission on uh, Human Rights is now dealing with the case of a woman who was divorced, uh, who was widowed in 1964. Her case was decided and finalized for property after 47 years in 2012. From 2012 to 2024, she has been running around for 10 years. She's now 91 years old, and her judgment of the Supreme Court has not yet been implemented. And she really epitomizes uh, what's wrong with the system. Uh, the system, I, I think it's very well uh, outlined by Justice Manila. Um, of course, the huge delay in the process of justice with 2.1 million cases pending the hurdles in implementation. And the third thing that we come across is the gender disadvantage. And I think what we tend to do when we talk about reform is we work in silos. And of course, as Justice Manila said, it's very, very, very personal. Uh, when one person wants, they can make substantive dis difference. But when that person leaves, um, it, the whole system, the whole edifice comes crumbling down. And so how do you ensure that all stakeholders, and if we look at the entire supply chain of what really justice involves, it is actually having protective laws, that legal protection, having the laws, knowing about the laws, having awareness of, of, of the existence, knowing how to access those laws, having legal aid and counsel. When you go to the police, what is the system of an investigation by the police? What is the system of adjudication? What, what does it involve? How are, in, how are judgments enforced? And lastly, is there civil oversight to these mechanisms? Now, what happens is we tend not to look at all the players in the system. We look at one player, the court system. We look at one player, legal aid, or we provide legal aid and the whole system will change. We will provide a police order 2002 and the whole system will change. But we do not look at the systemic connection, mm -hmm. the coordination between the players. Is there a coordination between these processes, what I call the supply chain? Is there friction in that supply chain? Uh, is it, do that, does that supply chain work in silos? Sure. And what it seems to me is that all of us work within our own very small parameters, even in the commission. Um, we, we, Pakistan tends to over-legislate and over-institutionalize. We have nine commissions, hmm. Commission of Women, Commission of Children, Commission on Human Rights, Commission on Minorities, Commission on Forced Disappearance. Do we need them? We have so many legal aid authorities. We have so many training institutions. Um, there's overlap, there's, there's confusion. Isn't it better to have a leaner, meaner machinery mm. and ensure that that machinery is in synergy with each other? 
And once there is in synergy, you then push towards uh, creating better linkages, greater accountability, more open government. So this is how I, I sort of see it. Um, and because the system is in, in all of, you know, we, the, the Ministry of Human Rights has just declared the 63,000 cases of women's violence have been reported. But the conviction rate is 0.3%. Um, you know, it, it, how do you how do you make life better? That is as you know that is the constitution, the right of, of the vulnerable. So this is how I see it. Okay. No, I think uh, once you. again, thank you so much. Uh, like Justice uh, Manila, you've raised some important points um, about the systemic connections, about to not. Uh, be institutional centric to talk to others, look at it as a supply chain. There's also the issue of over legislation and over institu institutionalization, as you said, uh, almost as a knee jerk reaction. And in some ways, this is also connected to what was said earlier by Justice Manila about the importance of different players talking to each other, about institutional leadership having continuity, and about reform being embedded in an institution rather than being personality centric. I think this sort of uh, flows quite smoothly into uh, what I wanted to ask you, uh, uh, Ali, because you have extensive experience actually working with every justice sector institution in one capacity or the other. Uh, and what I wanted to ask at a more nuts and bolts level, again going back to the diagnostic question, because we have over the decades also seen that there are, while there is over legislation, there are also gaps. There are important gaps which keep getting neglected, whether it's in the police processes, whether it is in the court processes, you worked extensively in reforming prosecution. Uh, so that's one question. What's your assessment about both diagnostics and these gaps? And the other question is that has one issue been that the reform dialogue has been too dominated by one institution or the other? Has it been yes. court-centric? Has it been executive-centric? Is that an issue? I think uh, on diagnostics, uh, my view is that uh, the diagnostics are broadly there, okay. and uh, they've been done correctly. So we all know that the case backlogs, we all know that the case delays, we know that the quality of investigations is not uh, very great, we know the prosecutors are not independent, we know all of this. So I don't think uh, that is something uh, which, which, which needs a debate, although the fine points of the diagnostic here and there, they may need some work, and I think that should be done. But uh, the real problem is, is not the diagnostics. The real problem is how to fix these problems. Mm -hmm. And there is a little agreement on that, let okay. me put it like that. And uh, for instance, if we talk about case delays and case backlogs, somebody would say that you need more judges. Somebody uh, would say that you need to raise the bar on entry of cases within the court system. Mm -hmm. Somebody would say that you need case management. Somebody would say that you need all of this. So, which is probably the case. And, and within the police, for instance, some, some people would say that you haven't got investigation kits and you know the training is poor. Somebody would say that the standards need to be reset. Yep. The codes of conduct for the police need to be issued. Somebody would say that that's not required. And uh, on the prosecution side, uh, there are also varying views how to fix the prosecution system. And I think, the reason for that is, uh, is, 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 I think dialogue is an issue. People don't like to talk to each other. And then somebody uh, would like to sit at the apex of the criminal justice or the justice system and then talk to others, which I don't think is, is the right way to do that. I think you, you need to accept that everybody has a place within the system. And uh, we're all working towards justice. We're not working towards presenting something to the other institution to finally decide it. That's not how it ought to be. Everybody has a key role within the justice system. If the police doesn't investigate very well, the case is never going to get into end into a conviction. The crime has been committed, even the suspect or the accused has been arrested, but that's not enough to land a conviction. Sure. So the prosecution has to work, the investigation has to work, the court has to work. The bar has to work towards that end. And if any, any of these four or five actors don't do their work properly, uh, the end result would be that there would be no justice. Now, why there is no agreement on, on, on the reform interventions or the treatment of, of this diagnostics which we've just talked? 
I think uh, the multi issues uh, are at, at multiple levels. Uh, one issue is, is, is the lack of understanding of the nuances of the criminal justice system. You think there's a, still a yes. an issue of rec recognizing the law itself that what it has to entail, or? I think I think I think uh, I, so my apologies. I don't really think that the criminal justice system is over legislated. I think it's under legislated. I think it's it's very broad. I think uh, prosecutors need to be more precise guidance. The police needs to have much more precise guidance as to how and when to make an arrest, how to question, how to record their testimony. It's all out in the open. So you can, you can use your discretion to put it in different ways, and that results in a, in a lot of inconsistency in decision making. And uh, again, the standards within the justice system vary. For example, if the prosecutors are saying something ought to be done, the police would say something else needs to be done. The standard, the the evidential standard which the police uses is different from the prosecutors. And obviously the prosecutorial standard is slightly less than what the standard the courts uh, administer, which is, which is, which is it or how it ought to be. The courts need to have a much more stringent standard, which is, which is, which is present there. But obviously you like to have these standards much more closer to each other in order to get a conviction. And, and that, that requires legislation, that requires uh, process setting, that requires training, that requires automation. But if you ask me, there is no golden intervention. Like if you ask me, do this and the justice system would be fine, that's not going to happen. Of course. If, if, you, if you issue a law and you say, look, we're going to, we've sorted out the criminal justice system, we've sorted out the civil justice system, that's not going to happen. Even by having the best of laws, you need, still need training, you still need files, and you still need automation, and you still need accountability to make sure that all of these standards are enforced. So I think that's a very, it's, 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 a, very, it's a very detailed sector, let me put it. Like, like you pointed out, it's complicated. So unless you have these manuals and these guidances and these trainings and these, you know, all of it put together, and legal education, legal education itself is a big issue because everything builds on that. But one thing as to why institutions don't seem to get on an even page, I think that's, that's the key question. There is political economy. I think within the institutions there is political economy and between the institutions there is political economy. So everybody wants to hold on to power. Uh, the police would not like to surrender their powers to the prosecutors. They would not, the prosecutors for instance in Pakistan as a in, in most parts of the world, uh, the prosecutors are not really independent in their decision making. They do not perform a gatekeeping role. They don't decide who is to be prosecuted, frankly. It's either the police or the court which decides actually who's going to get prosecuted. So uh, this is a key problem. So there is an imbalance of powers within the criminal justice system because obviously uh, the, within the criminal justice system there has to be a balance of powers, unlike the civil justice system, which is slightly different. But again, you see, and you have to put these interventions together. And arbitration can't really, or ADR, can't really work if your case management doesn't work because, because the quality of outcomes from your ADR system is heavily dependent on the quality of outcomes from the formal justice system. Because if, if you expect a particular outcome from the civil justice system, and there is, there is consistency and there is an agreement between the parties, this is what will happen. That would dissuade the parties from getting into the formal justice system and mm -hmm. they will try to go to ADR or try to sort it out outside the courtroom because there is a, there is a process, there is a time, and there is a cost involved in it. But that political economy, I think, is, is, is very deeply entrenched and uh, that political economy is not going to go away very quickly. So let me just try and sort of encapsulate it at the cost of sounding simplistic. We have a system which has multiple moving parts which are deeply interconnected. Yeah. And yet what I'm hearing for all three honorable guests is that there's a lack of dialogue and communication and the attempt that you're talking about, Jat Saab, is about embedding it in, into, an, into an institutional framework. I'm reminded of an example which is very close to my heart, which is, let's say, from the police, which shows both the technocratic nature of the problem and the political economy. Here's the technical problem. In all these years, we still don't have a fine-tuned protocol for collecting evidence from the scene of crime. Now, this is not a context-specific thing. How you collect DNA is the same in Denmark as it is in Myanmar, right? So one would tend to think that you could actually do it, barring resource constraints and all that. 
The other side of the picture is that in 20 years of reform experience with successive IGs of police and other people, I have not been able to understand why this easy picking has not been taken because it immediately has an impact on the quality of evidence you have. So we have a communication break breakdown, which takes me to my next question. I won't, we won't have the time to go through everyone, so please pitch in when you feel this is something you want to answer. Yeah, RPK points are related here, and which is institutional leadership and political will. So all this also has a cultural side to it. And here's my sort of slightly provocative observation. I seem to think that every single institution within the justice sector is incredibly hierarchical. Now, you, Jat Sahib, has, have a distinctively amenable, pleasant, and approachable personality. But that's not necessarily true for, let's say, other judges who can be incredibly aloof. That creates a huge issue. You're talking about the, the need to have a dialogue, the need to have this introspection. How does that change? It seems to me that the technical issue is less difficult. It's more the cultural. Uh, and that will take to my next question as well. Maybe the demand side has to strengthen for there to be extensive, specialized people pressure for there to reforms to take place. Culturally, what do you do institutions in the justice sector delivery? Mein hai? Culturally, the truth is that mindsets have to be changed. Sure. We are a very, very elitist society. There's no respect for the Constitution. Sure. You see, courts cannot write laws. Courts do not execute laws. I'll give you an example of Islamabad Capital Territory. Mm -hmm. In the Islamabad Capital Territory, the police order was enforced since 2015 but not implemented because there was tussle within the executive branches sure. between the police and the uh, district management group. Sure. And they somehow were not allowing that to implement that law. But it didn't stop there. In one of the cases, I was informed that you just uh, referred to the crime scene investigation sure. and why uh, the quality is so bad. For each case in the Islamabad capital territory, which, was, which is the capital of the country, 350 rupees Ridiculous per problem. case sure. Sure. is the expense, right. expense amount expense given amount. to the investigating office. Sure. Now, in that, he also has to go to the crime scene collect the evidence, and then deposit it, go on his own, pay for his transportation, and deposit it here in Lahore because there wasn't a laboratory in Islamabad. But sir, isn't the, now, the protocol has to be there, right? It, I mean, you make a protocol. It is not a question have, of yeah, protocol. Sure. It is a question of priorities. Mm -hmm. When our constitution says, that every citizen is equal. Mm -hmm. But we, in our, I mean, we all talk about ordinary citizens. There is no such thing as ordinary citizens. It's the mindset. You need to change the mindset. You have to, judicial reforms have never been a priority of the state. And the state has been defined in Article 7. None of those state partners have ever prioritized judicial system or reforms in the judicial system as a priority. Mm -hmm. That is why for an ordinary person, the expense that is paid to the IO is 350 rupees. Mm. It is such a, I mean, as far as I'm concerned, I think what is more important when you talk about diagnostic is to change the mindset, the mindset of the state itself. It has to realize that it is there to serve the people. And I'll give you only two or three recent examples. I mean, you all must have seen the pictures of the Supreme Court. It has, on the very front of it, a very big, door which you find always closed. And this building was designed by a Japanese architect 
who in the field of architecture was known as a legend and is known as a legend till today. But what was his vision? The stairs that go up to that door and then after door you enter into a big hall mm -hmm. and that hall opens up. All the courtrooms have their doors there. His vision was that the litigant will go up these stairs. The door was for the litigant and for the litigant's convenience, the, so that sure. they just enter a hall and conveniently can have access to their courts. But some wise person thought to change this plan. You and I know the name. They, well, I don't <laughs> want to. Again, you see. <laughs> it's history. That's true. Again, yeah. when I was elevated as Chief Justice of the Islamabad High Court, on my first visit, Ji. to the building that has almost now nearing its completion Ji. on the Constitutional Avenue. I was surprised that it was designed by a very, very, I mean, I don't want to name the consultant, but my first question to him was, there were no facilities for the litigants. True. True. So all these state players, the litigant is actually not there. Yeah. The litigant should be treated as the most important stakeholder and the litigant is the sole stakeholder. So when you talk about diagnostic, till the state and its players, they don't change their mindset Fair enough. to first treat that litigant as the most and the sole uh, stakeholder and all others as there to serve them, sure. till that there will be no change. Sure, so point well taken. I mean, this entire elite, elitist approach, which, which actually makes justice so inaccessible and dialogue so difficult. My next question is actually very much related to that, and I'll go to Madam Rabia, because I think considering that you're now heading the Apex Rights Protection Institution in the country, one of the things which one has encountered is that rights protection is also very debilitated by the fact that those whose rights are being violated are often unaware. They are unaware of what their rights are under the law, no matter how constrained or how encumbered those processes may be. And it's quite remarkable, and you know, we use the term supply side and demand side uh, of the justice sector, that in all these programs over the last 20 years, uh, there has been very token sort of uh, focus on the actual users of the justice system. You know, one has the odd, Pearl Continental Hotel uh, seminar, one has the Avari Hotel reception, and that's what satiated a lot of these box ticking in terms of, but in terms of even textbooks, in terms of even laws being translated, in terms of there being simple explanations of the process, free legal aid, these are areas which are, we are still far, you know, we built buildings, we've even increased the salaries in certain cases, we bought equipment, but this hasn't happened. So. How much do you think is the demand side of justice, uh, how much does it continue to be neglected? Well, I think, I think that this, um, the, your question actually also sums up what the previous speakers have very well said. Um, uh, Mr. Ali talked about, um, you know, um, uh, the uh, culture, um, which was also brought up by Justice uh, Menela, is how do you create a culture of empathy? Uh, when we go now and we uh, we have people litigants or people who come to us, uh, they really come to us after after sort of exploring all the venues in, and in the most mm. desperate of circumstances, and uh, the feeling is always that uh, to go to the police station and to cut an FIR is a privilege or is something that they have that the police has actually bestowed on us to go through the process of going to to adjudica uh, adjudication there is we have to change first of all very rightly said the culture and then as i keep repeating we need to have a system approach um you you talked about um I, I, at least i've talk, talked about the prosecution uh in islamabad there only we we became party in a case of usman mirza who had tortured and raped a, a couple and one of the biggest problems was that the couple resiled uh because no one ever used a witness protection 
When we called the prosecution, they told us that there were only 10 members of the 14 posts in Islamabad, but they're only occupied by 10 people. And they have 40 lower courts. So they're running, you know, like chicken with chopped heads left and right. Mm -hmm. um, how you, you have to look at things in that supply chain. Uh, in Cambodia, uh, for instance, child trafficking was one of the biggest problems in the government and they never knew how to resolve it. And then every single stakeholder involved in the process from the citizen to the machinery was involved in creating awareness on child protection. And it was it was the mantra, like we have seen no to corruption, you find everywhere. Nobody says say yes to justice or say yes to this. How do you create that synergy to create awareness, to create a demand, to create in for ensure that the citizen has its rights? Um, uh, how do you create synergies? I mean, I give you an example, uh, and I'd like to acknowledge Justice Manila uh, uh, gave us um, a report to do on torture in the jails, and we saw some juvenile children there. And it was his personal intervention that got the courts, the lower courts, so activated that they opened on the weekend, and we were mm -hmm. able to uh, ensure the release of about 75 young children. Um, how do we, and that was just one partnership, how do these partnerships work together? Can we create those partnerships? And I think because we've all, we're all more or less saying exactly the same thing. We're all saying that they're, that we're working in silos, the culture of, of abuse, a culture of privilege. Sure. Uh, we're all saying that we need institutionalization and, and, and a systemic approach. Um, and also I'd like to bring to a point is the level of trust. The World Justice um, Project had done an analysis of Pakistan and the level of trust that Pakistani citizens, when you talk of demand, is only 65%. And that's not just for the judiciary, those are the institutions that are involved in the access to justice. So how do you increase trust? How do you increase synergy? These are huge questions, and I'm glad that there's opportunity to talk about them. So thank you. So thank you so much for that. Two important themes which I really want to cover in the short time we have, because I feel that we'll all benefit from your insights. One is the level of technical competence and expertise in the sector. And that goes to the heart of legal education, but also training in all our training academies. You know, you and I have had, and I'm sure you in various oversight capacities have had an experience of the judicial training academies, whether the federal or the provincial. Uh, we've looked at the prosecution training academy as it has emerged, the police ones, the, uh, you know, the administrative staff college or the national management school. And let me be blunt, because I mean, this is a conversation which we are doing because we want to move forward. Um, the, level, the, the way pedagogy, the way curriculum development is still being looked at in most of these institutions is in the past century. Uh, and I say that as someone who's actually worked with them for 20 years. And, and now this is something which is connected to what you said earlier about priorities. But some of these institutions come directly under the oversight of institutions. And, and some of them don't necessarily have a budgetary constraint either. I mean, they have faculty, they have surplus budget. In any event, you know, curriculum development and pedagogy doesn't take that much money. You look around, you sit down, you think, and you do it. But we haven't done it. And this, to me, and bar uh, is something which we haven't spoken about. Um, the bar training courses or the continuing legal education is another area where there's a lot of scope. We have the, uh, we've had this mentioned in the National Judicial Policy, there's the Law and Justice Commission, there have been individual commissions. Why aren't we moving? Again, I'll say it is not the function primarily of the judiciary. No, I meant it for the entire sector. I'm not I'll, I'll just give you an example, and uh, fortunately, mm. uh, Rabia Javeri is also here with us. In 2019, I'd received certain letters from prisoners. And there were horrific stories, whatever was written in those letters. Sure. Well, high courts cannot co uh, do not have the power to uh, uh, have suo moto powers. Sure. But the rules say that the Chief Justice can dispense with the formalities and convert them into uh, petitions. And that is exactly what I did. And a commission was formed, which was headed by the then uh, Minister for Human Rights. And then a judgment was rendered, highlighting prisoners' rights. You don't need any legislation. Hmm. You, 
all you have to do and it was highlighted in that judgment the laws are still there on statute books they are not being implemented in the prisons they were overcrowded prisons i mean it was inhuman the way the prisoners were being treated the deputy commissioner is required to visit the prisons once in a month the district and session judges they visit the prisons once in a month but the inhuman treatment continued even after that judgment despite the fact that that commission was converted into an implementation commission and then recently about 3 months back before my elevation i received another letter and i was looking for an opportunity and i found i think the law that has established the national human rights commission it's a wonderful law and i engaged them and i took the chairperson rabia javeri with me to the prison it was horrific the reason it was horrific you don't require any education for that they were so poor those people actually had no access to justice she's talking about children despite that judgment mm -hmm. all it required is to implement the laws but there was no will there was no priority those people actually had no priority at all so it's unfortunate the entire system actually do not is not working to serve those people you don't need any education all you need is a will and an accountability that is not there even today go to any prison mm -hmm. the kind of treatment you see everyone is responsible for that you don't need any fresh legislation the legislation is all there the jail manuals are there they say the kind of treatment even that, that we saw followed, yeah. of the children sure it was horrific sure there's no oversight there's no accountability no, not just oversight you see in the capital their law the law provides that there has to be a social security department there has to be uh, uh, social security centers mm -hmm. there's nothing in that i mean no one is interested and that is the problem okay. and that is not a problem you see which can actually be tackled all by itself by the judiciary sure sure so ali uh, that sahab has pointed out this grievous sort of lack of will so to speak but and that is a given and i completely agree and i think there's no two ways about it but um do you think competence amongst the practitioners in our justice sector is an issue or is it just an issue of intent and the laws are there and they have the basic skills or is it both because um i mean i'll once again be completely candid when i've engaged not naming names but engaged with various institutions who brought me in to look at their curriculum and the curriculum and the way they teach it and i'm talking about training legal practitioners right whether it's the bar or whatever it was very flawed and i could see that tomorrow when they are in positions where they have to interpret the law they'll make mistakes but once again there was no will to actually do something even bringing me or somebody better than me in was token so that's to me we don't have a single textbook pakistani textbook uh in laws i mean what passes for textbook here is uh people publish statutes often with lots of mistakes and put their name in front and that's a textbook that's not the case in the neighborhood if you look at justice sector i don't understand how without that intellectual rigor and technical rigor we can actually expect the practitioners to also interpret the law correctly will is there i agree but there seems to be that's my bias that's what i've seen but ali what's your sense i think competence is an issue but not everywhere uh, again uh, within the justice system i think we can't make broad brush generalizations i think uh, uh, competence for instance i've been secretary law and uh, if you ask someone to draft legislation i think that it is this is a serious problem so people in this country do not have legislative drafting skills that's a big problem 
And uh, the result is what you have, because uh, it leads to more disputation. A lot of interpretations come this way or that way. So you have to really, it, it may be a conscious decision that you want to leave it to the judiciary to really interpret it like the Pakistan Penal Code or other broad pieces of legislation. But sometimes that's not the legislative intent. The intent is to pretty, to hold it tight. So there is no other interpretation or meaning than what the legislature or the executive wants to give to it. But even that cannot be translated because of competence issues. So, and, and, and competence at, at, at a certain level is, is a big problem. And that, uh, that is directly related to legal education, legal training, and all of this curriculum and other things. We, we all know that. Again, uh, one, uh, just as Manila pointed out as to what happens in the prisons, and uh, you see in, in some cases, um, I said the rules are there and they're not implemented. But since, since I've been Home Secretary twice, in certain cases the rules are simply not there. And uh, that is uh, the situation across the justice sector. Uh, that is also very unfortunate. Justice sector has got a huge amount of discretion in built in it. And that level of discretion I haven't seen in foreign jurisdictions or legal systems. You, you yourself come, you yourself seen that within the police, within the prosecution, within uh, courts, case management. They're pretty tightly worded and pretty comprehensive. So the amount of discretion which people have in, in other parts of the world is pretty regulated. But that's not the case in Pakistan. You see, when there is a lot of discretion, then uh, the actors or the people who implement these pieces of legislation or run these institutions also have a lot of discretion to act this way or that way. And when they can act this way or that way, that allows people to say, well, if I, you allow me to switch in Urdu, to you get a chance to get a chance to get a discretion in both sides. You get a chance to 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 get a chance. You pointed out about the crime scene. So, crime scene, because the rules or regulations or SOPs are not properly drafted, so, then you go and give it to them. Why do you give it to them? That means, people are not dumb. People who give money are not dumb. So, why have you seen that there are very elaborate systems that have been made for the transfer of money, transfer of investigation from this person A to person B? Why? Because person A matters and person B matters. So, if your system is tightly regulated, then person A or person B, it doesn't really matter. What difference does it make a person A is doing the investigation or person B is doing the investigation? Why are we getting lawyers and you know, transferring cases from this court to that court? Why? I must say the sole arrangement is based on persons. The direct reason for that is discretion. And that discretion is, is present at all the levels, starting from the registration of the FIR, to the investigation of the mm. case, to the prosecutor, even in, the, in, in, in jail. I mean, if you're not on good terms with the superintendent jail, your life would be hell. But why? Why do you need to be on good terms with the superintendent of jail? Because he's, he's the authority. Why is he the authority? Sure. Because there is nothing which tells him to do this thing or that thing on a, on a timely basis. You see, we, uh, there was this issue of jail visits to someone. And we said, why don't you allow these two times visit to prisoners in jail. So what I found out that the, actually the rules allow one visit for a fortnight and they were violating the rules by allowing one visit per uh, week. And this is uh, the response. And if, if I really ask them to implement the rules, this is what will happen. So the rules are also outdated, let me put it like that. And the access to bathroom facilities and things in, in jails, uh, but the rules say that you can give them sarson ka tel and you know, <laughs> I don't want to get into that. <laughs> and koile and koila jalane ke liye diya jayegi or lakdi jalane ko di jayegi. We haven't you know, even gotten or, into the colonial antecedents. Haan, ye ye so mojooda rules ki baat kar raha hon, jo statute sure. book pe mojood hain. They are present on the statute book. They are very much there. Yeah. Or uh, police ka, you, you yourself, uh, UK may for instance, I mean say their code A, B, C, D, E, and they're very detailed rules as to how you can make an arrest, what questions you can put, how to record those questions, how to do a search, how to record a search, very detailed rules. 
Here you go into the police rules, they're all hazy, here and there. You can do anything, anytime, anywhere in Pakistan. So the result is, you would like to have your investigating officer, you would like to have your own DPO, you would like to have your own IGP. Why shouldn't you like to have them? Customize justice. No, ju uh, discretion. And you know, this, and this is where the, you see, justice has two aspects to it. One is the outcome. Adalat se jo faisla ultimately nikalna hai, that's the, the process, ultimate outcome, yeah. na? Ke kutal ho jata hai, ya saza ho jati hai, ya party A civil suit jit jati hai, party B jit jati hai. But there is another aspect, that's the journey towards that outcome. And it starts very far off, in far off lands. So, and the crime has been committed in, in place A. People have been affected. So the police comes in, starts an investigation, a chalan gets prepared, somebody gets arrested rightly, somebody gets arrested wrongly. So he starts a tangential proceedings for getting his uh, freedom from the court and the prosecutor arrives, and then the court arrives, and then the lawyers arrive, and everybody. So this journey, this process, is very, very difficult. Problematic justice, Manala pointed out. These are the people involved in the process, and these people go through a nightmare. Even if he's an accused, he goes through a nightmare. So an accused should be brought to trial quickly, and the matter should end. And just because he's an accused doesn't mean that he should be tortured in prison or he should be, you know, treated unfairly. So even his, his, his rights don't end sure. with the conviction. So, but this process is, is really bad. And uh, this process is, is, is very discretionary. And the discretion leads to safarish, to money, to, to whatever, to social, you know, pulling your social strings, aapki safarishen, aapki sure, idhar sure. se telephone karayen, udhar se telephone, kyun bhai aapko telephone karana padta hai, why? Because telephones make life easy, telephones matter, that's why they come to you. Sure, sure. So aap jo ye culture hai, aur wo culture, dekhen, if you allow me to speak in Urdu, agar wo aapko system discretion allow karta ho, to ये कहना कि हम सारे morally upright हो जाएं और सारे नेकी और ईमान के रिश्ते उस पे चल पड़े ऐसे नहीं होता। तो कुछ दो चार परसेंट लोग होंगे जो नेकी और ईमान पे कायम होंगे, बाकी ठा पचानवे परसेंट नहीं हैं, बाहर भी नहीं हैं, ऐसे बाहर भी नहीं होता। तो वो या आपको पैसे देंगे, या आपको सवार्षिंग कराएंगे, या आप उनके बॉसेस से टेलीफोन करवाएंगे, तो एक पॉलिटिकल इकोनॉमी खड़ी होती है, पूरी की पूरी। I have seen जो आपने बात की कि क्राइम सीन कोई प्रोसेस करने के रूल्स और इस नो रॉकेट साइंस मतलब जैसे यूके में या फ्रांस में या अमेरिका में क्राइम सीन ने प्रोसेस होना है, वैसे ही पाकिस्तान में होना है, इट्स प्रीडी उसमें इतना कोई कल्चर का इशू नहीं है कि आप उसको रियली मॉडिफाई करें अपने निजाम के हिसाब से लेकिन वो नहीं बनने देते आई एम माई सेल्फ बीन पार्ट ऑफ दीज कॉन्वर्जेशन इन कॉन्सल्टेशन दिस वे और दैट वे दे विल अपोज इट बिकॉज देर इज अ होल पोलिटिकल इकोनॉमी स्टैंडिंग ऑन दैट there were cases of enforced disappearances. And, I mean, a court is completely helpless, you see, if someone comes and says that my loved one has been picked up, there's nothing that a court could do except to seek reports. And the state actors would come and they all will say, that, sorry, we don't know where he has gone. Mm -hmm. And for a court, it becomes very, very difficult. All that I did in one case, identify in law who was responsible. And that was a judgment, which is a reported judgment, that so and so person would be responsible for any person who is reported to have gone missing. After that, that judgment, I would only in any case that would come regarding enforced disappearance, I'll ask all those people to appear before me, and the next day the person would somehow from somewhere appear. Mm -hmm. So the law, it is not about discretion. It is about accountability. Say, for instance, take the example of prisons. The police rules 
the actually identify who would be the responsible if there's any human rights violation in the prison. Sure. The sure. deputy commissioner would be responsible. Sure. The uh, district judges would be responsible. But there has been never sure. been any accountability. So if I in may, very simple sure. terms, sure. you see, if there's a crime happens sure. within the class known as the privileged sure. or the elite class, sure. that becomes a news. Sure. The same kind of a crime happens every day as far as those people are concerned sure. who are ordinary people. No one is ever held accountable. I think what I have said is that Article 7 actually identifies who those players should be to be held accountable if there is anything wrong with the judicial system. Mm -hmm. And we ourselves, you see, are accountable for sure, that. Sure. So I, if I may, I mean, it seems to me that there are certain steps which are really preventive and others which go to the heart of ensuring that certain kinds of actions take place. It seems to me that what both of you are saying is not mutually exclusive. And the reason, if I may say that, is that if you have tighter regulation and tighter rules, the possibility of abuse goes down. At the same time, if you have really robust accountability, also the possibility of abuse goes down. I mean, they both work towards the same goal in some ways, and they're both different ways of looking at the problem. But I think both points very well taken. And frankly, I want to thank all three of you again for all these contributions. I have 15 minutes. I want to get the most out of this opportunity. I know you have to travel. So I'll do what in the good old days I used to do as a LUM student, to let the teacher know that I have a lot of questions. Uh, we won't be able to discuss all of them, but I think it is important that we at least earmark these as themes. I will come to you. I mean, we started late, and so I'm going to abuse uh, my presence here and, and go a little bit over time, but not too much. Budgets is something I wanted to talk about, but let's see whether we have the time. Um, I wanted to also get your sense of how the fact that we are in a unique position in the entire region where our reforms have been funded by donors, by and large. Uh, has had an impact on the kind of reforms we've had. I think there's a huge correlation. That's an entire theme in itself. I'm just laying out the menu in case you want to comment on one thing or the other. So is, there, is this the time to really move towards more indigenous, organic mechanisms and not rely on donor reforms, which we know had some advantages, but a lot of disadvantages as well? There's also the question that a lot of times, a lot of the issues are uh, allocated to political instability in the country, which is not under our control, but it is a huge factor, and we have to recognize. How do you make yourself instability-proof as an institution? The other question I had, and maybe that's what we'll focus for a few minutes and then go to others, is that it seems to me that the appointment, promotion, removal, performance and ass assessment, and accountability, which you've already highlighted, are mechanisms which are not quite working in justice sector institutions, which raises the question whether, I know it's difficult for the judiciary, but for the other institutions, you need any external checks. I mean, a lot of times this conversation has taken a, a place about external inspectorates for the police and the prosecution. I mean, these are important ideas which should be rigorously discussed at the policy level in Pakistan. And the final thing, I mean, I, I, I want to just park here as something you may want to talk about is that we seem to be still within the uh, I mean, justice sector very far behind when it comes to data. Uh, I've done extensive work over the years on data with the, uh, the you know, justice sector, and we are still far from that situation where data is actually being collected at a disaggregated level and it actually informs decision making. It's very basic. And for the life of me, it is difficult to imagine how in provinces, the size of our provinces, we can proceed ahead. And I wanted to get a sense of that as well. But I leave it to you for the next few minutes, perhaps to pick one of these things which you think is important and just make a brief comment. And then we'll take a couple of very brief questions and we'll wind it up because I'm cognizant of time and your travel plans and also your time. Anyone, any takers for any of these areas? Ali? I'll, I'll, I'll just a brief comment on instability. I think instability in Pakistan is a direct function of the robustness of the justice system. Sure. So if it's not working, democracy is not working. So the relationship between democracy and justice is very close. And uh, many times it's used for political ends as well. I'll leave that comment there. You, uh, you talked about 
external inspectorates. The external inspectorates are widely used in the UK and in some of the European countries. And it's, 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 it's a system which has been uh, partly put into place in Punjab. So we have an external inspectorate for the prosecution service. In the UK, there are external inspectors for the prison service, for Her Majesty's uh, court service, which is the magistrate service, and also for the prosecution service, and also for the forensic services. So they, they, their main purpose is, like Justice Manila pointed out, a kind of accountability, not uh, individual accountability, like if something wrong has happened in this case or that case. They're more like data-driven sure. arrangements. So they look at the pattern of cases. For instance, they would see that how many complaints have come in from the prisons, what kind of complaints come in from the prisons. So they look at systemic issues. Why does th do these kinds of complaints keep coming up? What's wrong? Is, is there something wrong with the persons who are implementing the law, or is there something wrong with the law itself, mm -hmm. or the rules itself? The problem with these external inspectorates is, and uh, which, is, which is a big problem why they cannot be put into place in Pakistan, is partly because of political economy, but also partly because of the fact external inspectorates tend to look at standards and compliance with SOPs. Mm. Since they do not, they would not like to go and find out whether sure. a person A has been, his, his, his rights have been violated, or person B has been, you know, person, this particular case has not been processed in accordance with law, they would not do that. And those standards are not quite there. The standards are not there, and when the standards are not there, they cannot hold officers accountable to them. I understand. That's a big problem. But all I can say is, I absolutely agree with Ali, but if the Constitution was being followed, all what we have discussed today should have been part of that report, which is the duty of the president or the governor, as the case may be, to lay before the respective legislatures. Because what we are talking about is that there is lack of implementation of the principles of policy. And if all these issues were part of that report, which is a constitutional obligation, and it had been debated every year in the legislatures, maybe things would have improved. Sure. That would have held us accountable as well, and all other players of the justice system. And that is what is actually required, that the president and the governors and the state to perform their functions as has been described in the constitution. And that is what is not happening. Sure. Thank you for that. Madam Rabia, any, any observations or comments on any of these areas which are closer to your heart? Well, Dr. Sama, I do not recommend any more, any more institutions. We have more than enough. I do not recommend another inspectorate. Uh, Pakistan, the government has a, has a propensity to make institutions after institutions. Um, I do believe that human resource and the politicization of recruitment and appointment and promotion needs to be looked at. I do believe that training needs to be emphasized. Uh, we have just given an example of prison. Uh, we have NAPA, which is the National Academy for Prison Reform. It's functioning with, uh, I think, about 20 courses a year maximum. Total number of people they've possibly trained is 80. Uh, you have now provincial academies that are doing prison reform. Some are now building huge structures and buildings to do what could very well have been done at the federal level. So we tend to create institutions after institutions. In for the bureaucrats, you have the, the Staff College and the National Institute of Public Policy. Now you have the National Defense University doing the same thing. They, we, we constantly make these structures uh, watchdogs over watchdogs over watchdogs. Um, what I do, what I do think, and I'd like to talk to you about the data collection. Uh, in the Ministry of Human Rights, we made the first ever human rights uh, man information management system at the ministry, and we developed through national consultations when I was secretary um, human rights indicators in two areas: health and education of women. 
And that was a huge process going to the provinces, ensuring uh, the ensuring that the system would feed into a central database. Today, it's not operational. Um, uh, the people who were trained at the provincial levels would feed into the system have been transferred. Uh, the same thing as happens when we do treaty body reporting. We use entities that that move and the, the treaty implementation cell, which exists in the provinces, uh, the, the members move every uh, uh, two or three months. So nobody's there to feed into the system. How do you create uh, training awareness technology and honor that system? There's a system now set up, uh, but if that system is not fed, the system will just become machinery. So uh, it is very important because when we also, when we talk about human rights reporting, we are always at a disadvantage because we look at violation-based reporting. Some bad thing happened and we're reactive, but there are many positive indicators which are not covered when you do treaty body reporting because they're not fed into the system. So our entire reporting in the story, the narrative of Pakistan tends to be very negative. And for that, we need to have better indicators and of course, better uh, data management system. Thank you. Thank you so much. I mean, there is just simply so much here which can be deliberated upon, and, and it opens up the possibility of debate. With your permission, just a couple of very quick questions because, uh, ji, batai. and then I'll come to you. Ji. Thank you very much, Dr. Osama. This is Adnan Bajwa, sir, and it's truly a pleasure to have such worthy speakers here. I would like to ask my question to Justice Minala. Uh, we have seen lately, not long before, uh, that judges has such power that they can uh, call the former prime minister to apologize in front of the court. Uh, I work for Interfaith and Intercultural Harmony in Lahore. So uh, if someone uh, do some kind of blasphemy or attempt anything like that or accused for blasphemy, so uh, if he is or she is a Muslim, or uh, then, then definitely uh, the accused uh, will be uh, uh, accused for uh, 95B, but if they are not Muslims, they will be directly accused for uh, 95C. This case is directly, in fact, moth uh, here. So, as a bossary cases, who are here, the Fori Torpe Jate, Java Muslim Hotel. Can I just ask you, much as I respect your right to ask that question, and that's an important theme. What we deliberately try to do here today is to talk about the system rather than individual provisions, injustices, cases, because otherwise there's no end. One of the tragedies of Pakistan is that we are not being able to focus on macro structural issues. If you want to answer the question, then it's their fault. But I think that we talk about the theme on which today we've talked about. Yes. Try to talk about the theme on which we've talked about. This is Muneev Ahmed, digital marketing expert. Uh, sir, as Sir Ali Murtaza has been mentioning that there are many loopholes in our accountability system and the constitution of Pakistan ensures a lot of rights that are about the right to, you know, freedom of expression, life, vote, etc. So where does the problem lie? Where, where is, you know, a lot of initiatives have been taken by the government to amend the situation, but the results are not. So have the institutions of Pakistan failed merely what actually they promised for? Thank you so much. I need to answer this question, whoever wants to. Well, I think it's, a, it's more complicated than loopholes in the accountability system. I think uh, the whole system has issues and not just the accountability system. The government of Pakistan, yeah, the provincial governments, hai, they've, they've done uh, some actions and they keep on um, um, everybody, every institution, the Supreme Court, the High Courts, and the government, they keep on trying to do many, many things. Some, sometimes the things work, sometimes they don't really work. The, one of the, one of the key things which have been done, if you really want to list me to list them down, is the establishment of the Punjab Forensic Science Agency. I think that's a, it's not just about the institution, it's about a, it's about a change in investigating uh, offenses. So you, you look at scientific evidence much more closely and try to bring that before the court. So that's a, that's a game changer. And uh, a lot of cases go through that system, and a lot of uh, difficult cases have been uh, d detected because of forensics. The other provinces need to do that. The federal government needs to do that. 
And uh, the other things uh, which have happened is uh, maybe it's the setting up of the prosecution services across the country. Every province has got a prosecution service. Even ICT has now got a prosecution service. There are issues within the prosecution, grave issues, but at least the institutions have been set up as more autonomous and more independent institutions, separate from the police and the, and the judiciary. Work has been done on case management. Work has been done on legal aid, but that has not gone forward because of uh, monetary and budgetary constraints. Macro things have also been done. Uh, Dr. Sama has been part of So the Punjab government uh, laid out a roadmap for uh, rule of law reform, which was very complicated and very good. But uh, since all of these issues which we've talked about are also there, there is uh, difficulty in arriving at agreement between what needs to be done at a more structural, as, as you have seen right here, whether we need to have more institutions, we don't need to have institutions, we need to have standards, we don't need to have standards, you must have followed this debate. So there are different views on it. So unless obviously there is a agreement on views, a lot of these things uh, cannot be done and have not been done. And till they're done, we will remain at maybe like 130th, 40th on the Thirty. justice sector Keeps index. Pakistan is at the bottom, so we need to do something. There are four you know countries that. mostly below us. Uh, last question. It will or maybe Afghanistan or Somalia. So you raised your hand earlier. I'm so sorry to the rest, but you know I'm working under multiple constraints. Uh, we are available outside, whoever is here. Ji, bole. Bole, 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 jaldi se bole. Uh, thank you, Sir Usama. My name is Muhammad Rayyan Faisal, and I'm a student of international relations from Bahri University, Islamabad. My question is for uh, Justice Athar Minullah. Uh, sir, you argued that, uh, that the problem is in the political will, and the problem is of prioritization, which results in the implementation of law. Uh, and you disagreed with the dis discretionary space, which was pointed out by Sir Ali. Sir, if you could please point out some uh, recommendations or suggestions or measures which will increase the political will or prioritization, or do you think that it is uh, an evolutionary process which will resolve with time? Uh, first, I think I'll address uh, this question. You see, we have a history of 70 years. Again, I'll say the most important a value of a society is to respect rule of law and respect the constitution. The questions from both the sides actually reflect that there has, at least in the past and even today, the constitution is neither respected nor the state has the will to implement that constitution. We, have, we live in a society where people are, and there are examples where people have been lynched on the basis of false allegations of blasphemy. And that is all, you see, we have a long history. I don't want to go into the history. But the constitution is based on civil supremacy and civil control. Unless the Constitution is implemented and respected in letter and spirit, nothing will change. We will continue like this. And probably, I mean, it's very, very embarrassing to be globally uh, on, uh, ranked as 136th on the uh, law of rule, uh, rule of law index. But that's the reality. We all know that that's the reality. It's simply because the Constitution has not been respected, and it is even not respected till today. But it's for the people. It is for the people's representatives to take that lead. Unless that happens, I mean, we have examples of elected prime ministers having been hanged, and later, I mean, that's regrettable. So if we really want to change, we must follow and implement that constitution. So, Justice Malala, thank you so much for taking out the time, for traveling for this, despite your very busy schedule. 
Uh, Madam Rabia, thank you so much. Despite your commitments in Karachi, you took out this time. And Ali, as always, thank you. So, SERP, IDEAS, IGC, IDS, Mehbubulak Institute, and LUMS. I got all of them. Thank you so much for putting this together, this three-day conference. I think it's incredibly important that we also take out time from getting completely obsessed with current affairs and whatever is reported on TV and try and get into drier but significant and important deeper debates about the sector with the same level of candor and openness with which our three guests very kindly grace today's occasion, for which I'm deeply grateful to them. Thank you so much. Thank you to you.